So that definition of a bounded linear operator sounds fairly intuitive, but let's try and understand what it actually means. So here's your normed space x, and here is your normed space y, and in between acts your operator a, and the fact that it is a bounded operator means that it maps every bounded subset of x, for example this one, into a bounded subspace of y. So this is the image of S, then that would have to be bounded. So by definition of bounded sets, our set S fits inside a disk around the point x. We could take x equal to the origin, 0 of x, of a certain radius. And then its image A of S will have to fit inside some circle around some point. We could also take the origin at the other side, y. Let's say of a radius capital R, because it's certainly not going to be the same as the radius of the first circle in x. Okay, so that's immediately what the definition says. Let's try to simplify that, because it's not really handy if you want to work with it. Now instead of starting from an arbitrary bounded set S on the left in X and forcing that its image A of S on the right hand side be again bounded so it can be covered by a disk, we could as well start by a whole disk on the left and require that the image of this whole disk on the right be bounded. So one can show that the image of a circle or of a disk is always some sort of ellipse by symmetry relations that we can conclude from linearity. And the origin is going to be mapped to the origin, so that's again in the center of this object. Okay, and the fact that it is bounded means that, again, this can be covered by a disk around the origin. Again, with some finite radius. Maybe it's a bit different from the previous radius, capital R, let me call it R dash. Okay, that already sounds a lot easier. Instead of saying that any bounded set has to be mapped to a bounded set, we are now just requiring every disk around the ori origin to be mapped to a bounded set. Actually, we can simplify this further. Well, if we simply divide the whole scene by little r, we multiply by 1 over r on both sides, then on the left, Instead of a disk around zero with radius r, we are looking at the unit disk, which is the disk around zero, or the origin with radius one. So we're only talking about one set anymore. And on the right, we end up with a covering disk of radius, let me call it for simplicity, t, where t is just r dash divided by little r. So why is this working? Well, because of linearity. If you multiply something by alpha on the left, then the image is going to multiply just by alpha on the right, and here our alpha is 1 over little r. So our operator A is bounded if and only if it maps the unit disk in x to something that can be covered by a finite disk in Y. And without loss of generality, that finite disk can be considered around the origin. So let's write that down. So it means there exists a radius, capital T, such that for every little 
x and x with norm of x less than or equal to 1. So we are talking about all of these points in blue here. The image A of x, which is maybe something in blue over here, is inside that red circle. So its norm is less than or equal to t. Okay, and moreover, the smallest such t, which is the supremum of all norms that Ax can have when x is running through the unit disk in x. is denoted by norm bars a norm bars and is called the operator norm of a. Well, often we just drop the word operator here and just say the norm of a. Okay, well, that should probably be a definition. Right, well, you should definitely practice what an operator norm is in concrete cases. And the chance to do is, is for example, problem six on our first problem sheet. Okay, well, we should definitely try to understand this operator norm a little bit better. So let me again start with some point x in the unit disk. So this is the disk of radius 1 around the origin. But let's this time take a point x that is not inside but rather on the boundary of that disk which we also call the unit circle. Okay, now what happens to that point under our map A? It ends up on the other side as A of x, somewhere on the boundary of that ellipse around the origin that we get as the image of the unit circle on the other side. And the largest, let me call it, radius of that ellipse t, like we called it before, is just what we define to be the norm of A. So just in short, what are we saying here? If the norm of x equals 1, then the norm of Ax is less than or equal to t, but instead let's write norm of a. Now let me again multiply both sides of this diagram by the same little alpha. We know that we can do this. So little alpha multiplies here, and the same little alpha multiplies there giving us radius of alpha, where the radius was 1 formerly, and radius of alpha times norm of a, where it was just norm of a before. So we conclude that if norm of x equals alpha, then norm of ax is less than or equal to alpha times norm of a, but I mean, instead of alpha we could just write norm of x, so we get that norm of ax is less than or equal to norm of a times norm of 
x, and that is a very important formula. You can derive it by many other ways, and some of them you might find easier than this little diagram I was showing here, but maybe you like this way of seeing it. So your takeaway message here is that the norm of A, the operator norm of an operator A, tells you by how much the length of your vector x can be multiplied at most. So if your vector x has length 1, then the result after applying the operator A can have length at most 1 times norm of A, which is norm of A. Well, if your vector has length 7, then your result will have length at most 7 times norm of A. And that's just what is summarized down here. So keep this formula in mind when you look at problem 6.